forgot how much I like this fluffy sweater. I mean, look, if I pull up the hood, it's even got ears like a polar bear. Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow women's soccer fans, welcome to the women's soccer slash football podcast. I'm your host, Bryce, and I'm just super pumped to have you with me here on another episode. We've got a ton of great, exciting things going on in the world of woe, so like we do each and every week. And I can't wait to share them all with you. We've got birthdays, sponsorship deals, crazy results, relegation battles, and we're going to cover it all here in this episode. If you like what you're hearing or seeing, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, or whatever you do to support your podcast channels or YouTube channels. Or if you want to listen to this on the go, since you're watching this on YouTube right now, we have an audio-only version available. I'll link that down in the description below for you to view. And as also, if you're looking for more content that's going on each and every day, I use TikTok and Instagram almost every single day, and we've got you covered there too. I'll link that down in the description below as well, should you be interested. But with all that boring stuff down out of the way, let's get into the show. So we're going to kind of abbreviate all the segments that I usually do for each episode, because to me it just makes a lot more sense rather than doing a a segment and then referring back to the old segment and just the very next one. So we're just going to do a bit of a mashup here. We're going to kind of combine the Women's Football of the Week and the Moment of Silence. This is what we'll do. We will dedicate the moment of silence to our women's football of the week. Our women's football of the week is going to be the one and only, the honorable, one of my top three favorite players in the world, Fran Kirby. That's right. For her performance, her masterclass, unselfish, world-beating, tower of towering power whatever performance where she scored two goals and had four assists in a cup final. That was the stuff of legend, and it was one of my favorite final performances that I have ever seen in the world of Woso and in sports in general. That doesn't happen very often where you have that many goals and that many assists and that many goal involvements in a game in general, let alone in a cup final. So, you Fran Kirby, if you'll join me on the count of three in the moment of silence and also dedicating this in crowning her the Women's Football of the Week, please indulge me. One, two, three. So. Loot. All right, ladies and gentlemen, who is your women's footballer of the week? Who did you dedicate your moment of silence to? Feel free to jump down in the comments below and let me know what you think. All right, so let's start getting into some main topics, shall we? For this first main topic, we've got some good news, but we've also got some bad news. Good news is we have a Continental League Tires Cup Championship winner declared Try saying that five times fast. It's very, very difficult. Chelsea women have won the tournament. They bested Bristol City at the weekend by a scoreline of 6-0, to nil, which is about what I expected going into the match. I believe Chelsea had scored 16 goals against them in two games. So, I mean, not really too big of a surprise there, especially since Chelsea are one of the best teams in the world, but that's neither here nor there. Well, we do have a champion, and that's great news. The bad news is, and this is the one thing that a lot of people are probably wondering about, is Marin Mielda ended up suffering a pretty bad injury in the middle of the game. It was in the 75th minute. She collided with a Bristol City player. I believe it was Amy Palmer, if I'm not mistaken. But she went down screaming. It was really horrifying to actually hear. Go on, if you just uh, look for... Actually, I'll link the video down in the description below for you guys of uh, the injury. She went down. She was screaming. She was holding her left leg. And a lot of the Bristol City and Chelsea players alike were really terrified for her. They immediately went and knelt down next to her and checking on her, and then medical staff came on. It was pretty bad. Anyways, it turns out that she did, in fact, suffer a knee injury, which that was pretty obvious from watching the game unfold. But um, it's not as serious as we as they thought, which is great news. She's going to be getting surgery. She'll be out for the rest of the season but she'll be able to rejoin the team early in the summer from what she was saying. The BBC published an article interviewing her just on the state of her injury, and she will make a good recovery and she'll be back in the summer, which is great news because with knee injuries like that, oftentimes it can be at least a year-long recovery. So super happy that Marin Mielda is okay and that she'll be making a return pretty soon. Gutted for her that she's going to miss the rest of the season, though, because Chelsea are making a title run and could really use her, so... All the best to her and her good health. That's the good news. That's the bad news. But anyways, what were some key moments of the match? It was all Chelsea pretty much all game long. Scoring When you score six goals, that's pretty much how it kind of goes, right? Like when your team is just clicking on all cylinders like Chelsea has, you're going to win. 
here's how it all unfolded. So it started off right away in the second minute. Kirby screams down the right-hand side of the pitch. She receives a ball from Guro Raitan, who just gives her a beautiful through ball. I'm telling you, go, we've two through two different Bristol City defenders, and then Frank Kirby immediately crossed it across goal to Sam Kerr, who was waiting at the far post. And Sam, all she had to do was tap it in. That opened up the scoring, gave Chelsea an early lead. Fast forward just eight minutes later, Sam course Sam Kerr scores the second goal this time around. She gives us a great backflip that we've all been waiting for. Absolutely love Sam Kerr's backflips, and I miss seeing them, especially when she played for the Red Stars. That was a good time. Kirby intercepted a pass from a Bristol City defender. She took it to the right-hand side again and ended up um, giving a short pass to Kerr, who shot it with her left foot onto the right side of the net, and then ensue backflip, and she's got a brace. The third goal, moving on just about 20 minutes later, this one is going to come from Fran Kirby. She gave it the long-range fish and chips, I like to call it. She intercepted the ball from Bristol City's keeper, Sophie Bagley, who coughed it up, and then Fran Kirby ended up taking a couple dribbles and shooting from about 25 out. It was really awesome, and she scored, scoring her first goal in the match. And by this point, just 30 minutes in, she's got one goal and two assists. Let's keep it going. Just five minutes later, Fran Kirby scores her second goal in the match. She takes it herself and basically scores off of the keeper's body. She deflected off Sophie Bagley and it went in, so kudos to her. But Sam Kerr for this one brought the ball down into the middle of the field, and then you just see Fran Kirby screaming down the left-hand side of the pitch. She ran, I would say, 70 yards to score this goal, so good on her for that. But she receives the ball from Sam Kerr, cuts inside, Shoots the ball, hits Sophie Bagley, and it goes into the back of the net. So that so at this point, 35 minutes in, Fran's got two goals, two assists. Let's keep it going to the second half. In the 48th minute, Sam Kerr scores her hat trick, the long-awaited moment for the match. She uh, Guru Raitan receives the ball from Fran Kirby. Fran Kirby continues her run down the left-hand side of the pitch. Guru Raitan gives her a through ball, which. Kirby receives, she takes it to just inside the penalty area, stops, sees Sam Kerr on the other side of the penalty area, dishes it out to her, Sam Kerr scores, gets her hat trick. Love the unselfish play from Fran Kirby on that. We worship you for that. And then, continuing on into the game, the last goal of the game. Oh, excuse me, guys. Uh, Guru Raitan scores in the 54th minute. So again, Fran Kirby's got an opportunity to get her hat trick here, but what does she do? Unselfishly passes it off to a teammate, and they all go wild. It was fantastic. For this one, Sam Kerr got the ball on the right side of the pitch. We see Fran Kirby make a run toward the right-hand corner of that same side. Sam Kerr dishes it off to her. She receives it, looks over to her left, sees Guru Raitan all alone, passes it off. Easy tap And So on the day... Fran Kirby had two goals and four assists. That is absolutely masterclass. And wouldn't you know it, she was the woman of the match, and rightfully so. It was absolutely a wonderful performance. It was probably, next to Carly Lloyd's championship performance in the 2015 World Cup, that was probably one of the best championship performances I've ever seen. Of course, I'm going to give the edge to Carly Lloyd on it being the best performance because it was in not only a World Cup, but also I'm a U.S. Women's National Team fan, for those of you who do not know. And plus, in when you're on the biggest stage in the world in the World Cup and you beat the second best team in the world at that time, that's a pretty big deal. Not to discount Fran Kirby's performance, though. This was absolutely masterclass. Um, she exercised humility, unselfishness, this uh, ravenous want to score goals and provide opportunities for her teammates. She did it all this game, and she's been doing that really well all season long. So shout out to you, Fran Kirby. Absolutely wonderful. Um, in terms of a tactical analysis for this particular game, not really much of one to give. Like I said, Chelsea dominated all game long from literally the start of the whistle all the way to the end. And I really didn't expect much different. Like I said earlier, they had scored 16 goals against Bristol City in the last two matches they played. And now I believe they're up to, my math is right, 22. So they, they just dominated all game long. And the one big takeaway I think I like about this game is that partnership between Sam Kerr and Fran Kirby. I've seen it a couple of times with Chelsea throughout the season where they'll have them almost play a left striker and a right striker, which 
it's proven to work really, really well. Every time, just about every time Chelsea do that, they win matches. The last time they did it was when they beat United, and look how that turned out. They beat United, much to my chagrin and sadness, teardrop for those of you who are listening on audio right now. But it, it makes for really good entertainment from a footballing perspective because who doesn't love seeing a ton of different goals go down and a ton of creativity? I mean, they just feed Sam Kerr and Fran Kirby just feed off of each other really, really well. And for Chelsea, it pays dividends. They're starting to see all of their pieces that they've picked up over the years come to fruition. And then when you throw Perneal Harder into the center attacking midfield mix, well, then now you've got an unstoppable trio that I would argue is probably one of the best in the world. So things are looking bright for Chelsea. I cannot wait to see them play Manchester City later on for the WSL season and just see how that impacts the title race. It's going to be something special to watch, so keep your eyes peeled. Um, I would say in that partnership that Fran is doing most of the setting up, which makes a ton of sense, right? Because Sam Kerr is more of a pure, bona fide, proven striker than Fran Kirby, I would say. And Fran is more of the winger type where she provides the service. So it, it really plays well to their strengths. So I'm not really surprised that that's how it, it generally turns out. Most of the time in that partnership um, in, in the game, it's evident too. Kerr scored three, Sam, or yeah, Kerr scored three, Fran assisted four. So it, it, it all adds up in my mind. It, it's, it, it's absolutely perfect. Um, at the end of the day, I'm going to kind of shift over a little bit to more of the Bristol City side of things because the fact that they were even there in the Continental Tires Championship match is, I think, a true testament to how well they played in this tournament. I think that despite them losing pretty badly to Chelsea in the championship match, that they should be proud of their performance in the tournament entirely because in the WSL, they haven't had the greatest season. They're in a relegation battle. Their goal difference, I believe, is still around minus 40, so it hasn't been great for them in that aspect, but they're still finding a way to get opportunities to win silverware, and for them to get to the championship in the manner that they did, I think it merits uh, praise, and I, they've, I think they've got the potential to do good things. They've got Ebony Salmon, who is a really young, promising talent, at just the age of 19, which freaks me out, but they've got the pieces to put together a solid team, and I think that they'll get better in time. And as the season WSL season's been going on, they've been proven to play better and better. They've won a few games in the last few weeks. They're starting to crawl their way out of the relegation battle. So I think that the fact that they're just there at the championship game in and of itself is something to be praised. Of course, no one loves losing 6-0 in a, in a cup final. That's never fun, but nevertheless... I think they should be proud of what they've done for this, uh, what do you call it, for this uh, Continental Tires League Cup run. And honestly, on the flip side of that, if they did end up beating Chelsea and they did win this tournament, I think it goes down as one of the best Woso upsets like ever because, just wow, because, I mean, Bristol City is one of the worst teams in the WSL and Chelsea is one of the best teams in the world, the world, mind you. And if Bristol City beats them, I think it tops the upset of Brighton beating Chelsea to ruin their two-year uh, unbeaten run. So that, that would have been cool to see, like, like I said, especially from a footballing perspective. It's something I can appreciate, and I love seeing upsets. Who doesn't love an underdog, right? But um, at the end of the day, Bristol City should hold their heads up high. Chelsea w won it, well-deserved, and not really a ton of surprises on that. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I want to know, what did you think of the Conti Cup final? Feel free to jump down in the comments below and let me know what you think. Let's get into another main topic, which is just going to be a midweek recap. So a lot of WSL fixtures have been going on during the week this week because postponements, things getting made up, that's natural, right? So I want to catch you all up on the results that have been going on around the league and some other things as well. So we'll start off with Everton Chelsea. Chelsea ended up winning the match today by scoreline of 3 to Everton's nil. Overall, who scored for Chelsea in this one? Fran Kirby, the honorable, the legendary, opened up the scoring in the 14th minute with a goal. Just about 45 minutes later, jumping into the second half, Perneal Harder ended up adding to that tally and scored in the 60th minute. Then to round off the scoring on the day, Melanie Lupul scored in the 79th minute, and that about all that's about all she wrote for the match. So not really too surprised that Chelsea ended up coming away with the win for this one because they have been on a good streak lately. And then, as I've mentioned in uh, previous episodes, Everton have proven to crumble against teams that are above them in the table. 
they I don't believe all season long they've beat City, Everton, United, or Arsenal at all. So I'm not really too surprised that they lost this one. And plus, I think Chelsea have a lot more riding on them in this particular case. Every single match matters if they're going to go ahead and win the title. I think that what they'll do is they'll end up winning out, but their match against City in April is going to decide who the title winner will end up being. So if Chelsea loses it all leading up to then, it puts a lot of pressure on because then that means they have to beat City, and even then that might not be enough because of goal difference and things like that. So not really too surprised. They have a ton of play for, and they've got to win each and every week. So Chelsea 3, Everton nil. What was the next match that happened on the day today? Brighton, Havalbion, and Aston Villa took each other on today. Brighton came away victorious by a scoreline of 2 to Aston Villa's nil which I'm not surprised because they're coming off of a month in which their manager was just declared manager of the month. Congrats to Hope Powell on that. And also Aileen Whalen was one of the contestants for the player of the month as well. So they have been playing very well as of late and they continue that run today. Who all scored for Brighton? Aileen Whalen herself in the 21st minute opened up the scoring and the score was 1-0 all the way up until like the last 10 minutes of the match when Kagman ended up scoring the second goal in the 81st minute and ended up sealing the victory for Brighton. So this was a massive, massive result for Brighton and a big three points because now they have crawled their way out of relegation from losing to Bristol City 3-0 about a month ago. And now they've won four in a row and they've climbed all the way up to sixth. With the win, they bypassed Reading and are now in sixth and are just behind Oh, what are they called? Everton. Sorry, I blanked out on the name for a second. And plus, Brighton, Everton, and Reading have all played the same number of games, and Brighton is only four points behind Everton, so they're not trailing far behind. This It's getting really, really interesting to see how the relegation battle is changing each and every week. From the Aston Villa perspective, this is a very damaging result because with them being so close to the relegation spot, they're only one point out and in 10th place currently you gotta at least come away with a point even if they drew that's still a big point that they can use to ride to the rest of the season not really too surprised that they lost in this one given Brighton's run of form they've been playing very excellently lately and they've been on fire and they've been riding the wave so not really too surprised here Aston Villa there's a chance they'll get relegated and they're still scrambling in that spot so we'll see what happens as the season goes on what was the third match of the day We had a Bristol City, Manchester City top table versus bottom table clash. Manchester City walked away with this one with three goals. Bristol City walked away with none. So who all scored for Manchester City today? Caroline Weir opened up the scoring in the 12th minute. And then Ellen White followed up with it just 18 minutes later in the 30th minute, doing what she does best, scoring goals for club and country, which is what all great strikers do. Then to finish off the scoring... In the 89th minute was none other than our favorite, the Tower of Power, Sammy Mewis. She ended up scoring later on in the match. And Manchester City walked away with their... I have lost track of their win streak at this point. They're, they've won double-digit games in a row. And a walked away with a clean sheet. So Gareth Taylor's side is just utterly dominating everybody. So for this match, I wasn't really too surprised at the result. Usually with Manchester City and the way they've been playing the season... It's not a matter of whether or not they'll win. It's a matter of by how much. And that was my biggest question mark going into this match is how much would they win by? I think my prediction was 5-0 and they only scored three goals, which for Bristol City being very, like their deep bottom of the table, I'm surprised City didn't end up winning this game 6-7-0. That's just typically what they do. It's not to say that City's not on form. It's just I expected the deficit to be bigger. But on the flip side of that, good on Bristol City because they just came out of a Conti Cup final where they got destroyed by Chelsea 6-0. I actually think that this result is, oddly enough, even though it's a loss, is a positive sign for Bristol because it's showing that they're adapting and playing better as the season's going on. Normally, if if they would have played this match two months ago, they probably would have lost 6-7-0 to Manchester City, but they only let alone three goals. They didn't have any yellow cards, so they showed great discipline throughout the match. I think that this is a step for them in the right direction. And considering that they just played City and they just came off of playing Chelsea, when they play Tottenham on Sunday, it's going to feel like a ginormous weight off their shoulders, and they're going to come away with a massive three points against Tottenham. So mark my words, that'll be my prediction for that match. So 
What was the last match on the day today? There was West Ham United, Birmingham City. This match ended up in a 2-2 draw, which I believe that's what I ended up predicting. I think my scoreline prediction was 1-1. Who all scored in this game? Uh, Murphy for Birmingham City opened up the scoring early on in the ninth minute, but just five minutes later, West Ham United answered with the goal in the 14th minute from Flaherty. Then Emily Van Eggman ended up giving West Ham United a lead early on in the second half in the 46th minute. And West Ham United, they held on to that lead. They held on to it. They held on to it. They held on to it until the 94th minute when Haley Mace crushed their dreams and decided to score in stoppage time. So, wow. I mean, I am gutted for West Ham United at, at this point because they're in a relegation battle. They're second. They're just one point. I believe they're just ahead of the relegation zone on goal difference at this point. So if they would have walked away with three points today, it would have made a world of a difference for them. They would have jumped above Aston Villa on the table. They would have, I believe, even jumped Birmingham City in the table at this point. Of course, there's games in hand that you have to consider, but still, three points is three points. And when you're in a relegation battle, every single one counts. So they'll be. Go- it'll feel like more like two points lost than rather than a point gained in this in this case. The fact of the matter is they still walked away with a point and they crawled out of the relegation spot, so good on them for that. That'll be somewhat of a morale booster. But for them to t- draw the game in the manner they did, that's just got to be soul-crushing, I feel, for them. We'll see who gets relegated. That's going to be the really interesting spot going into the end of the season. I think the relegation battle is a lot more interesting at this point than the title contention battle because for relegation, it could be anybody and there's still a ton of games to make up. On the flip side for Birmingham City... uh. I really don't have much to say on on their part. They haven't been playing great as of late. They've probably been the least interesting team in the WSL throughout the season. They scored two goals. They normally don't do that, so that's a positive sign for them, and they walked away with a point today, and they got a point at the very last second of the match, so it'll feel like more like a victory than for them than anything, so really, really exciting stuff in the world of the WSL. There's still two games that are going to be going on this week if you're looking for something to watch on Friday, March, uh, make sure I got the day right, 19th. I'll, I'll hopefully be able to watch highlights of this one because I will be busy during the game. However, Arsenal and Man United will take each other on at, if I'm not mistaken, 12.30 p.m. Central Time. So if you're here in the States, it's going to be in the middle of the day on Friday, and if you can watch it, I highly recommend it. I think this game is going to decide that third Champions League spot. And me as a Man United fan, I hope that United at least come away with a point because then that greatly improves their odds. Um, like I've mentioned earlier in the show, I'll link the description down below as to Arsenal's champion league's hopes and what happens if they win, lose, or, or otherwise. So it should be really interesting. Hopefully you'll get a chance to watch it. And then the last match of the weekend, as I alluded to earlier, was Tottenham and Bristol City. They'll be playing on Sunday, March 21st. I'm anticipating that Bristol City are going to come out hot in this one and end up winning it. I think my scoreline prediction was 2-2 two, two, Tottenham's 1. So Bristol City, I think, are going to get a massive three points and really upset the relegation battle this weekend. So that is going to be a game to watch. So that's just catching up on the WSL results during this uh, interesting WSL week. What else has been going on in the world of WSL? Well, there's a U.S. Women's National Team birthday today. The legendary, the most prolific goal scorer in the history of the U.S. Women's National Team and also tied in third for caps, if I'm not mistaken. Mia Hamm turns 49 today. She is one of the most gifted players to ever play the women's game and the game in general. She is a maestro with the ball, and she scores like no other. If you haven't seen her play, please go on YouTube and watch some highlights and just sit back and enjoy it. It's a ton of fun to watch. Um, What else has been going on in the world of Woso? There's two things related to sponsorships for players. Actually, I'll add in a third now that I can think of it. We'll start with Rose Lavelle. New Balance made a cleat for Rose Lavelle. And let me tell you, it's absolutely sweet. It's all white. It's decked out. I'm going to try to find a way to get a pair for myself just to have because they just look so cool. I'm like, man, I need to buy one of those. So uh, something to keep your eyes out on. And plus, New Balance, I think, is a really underrated brand. So there's that as well. Uh, the second piece of that, Katarina Macario is now an Adidas athlete. She has signed a sponsorship deal with them which is super exciting because that shows a ton of growth and promotes her global notoriety. Adidas is really good at both of those things. Plus, as an Adidas guy myself, I'm a big fan of their gear, so if they have some things that they create for Katarina Macario, I can't wait to see what they look like, and I'll be keeping a close eye on that. 
Uh, overall thoughts and observations for that. It seems really interesting that she picked Adidas because um, most of the time, US Women's National Team players, when they're up and coming, they end up signing with Nike. However, I think Adidas is more of a global presence, at least in my mind. Then again, I, I'm not really a brand snob in general, so don't really know much on that front. However, I think Adidas will give her a good global presence and everything that she needs. So really excited and pumped for her to be signing that deal. Then lastly, the last sponsorship deal I can think of is Portland has signed, I believe, a three-year deal with TikTok, which to me just perfectly fits the Portland Thorns. It's really trendy. It's really it's it's in right now, and TikTok will be for a long time, so it makes a ton of sense to me. TikTok, their logo will be featured on the right shoulder of their jersey for the next few seasons. And with their jersey, it really looks sweet. If you are able to, feel free to go look up pictures of their jersey. It's really, really awesome. So Portland is making another connection on that front, and I'm really excited to see it. More sponsorship means more money, means more awareness, means better for the whole Woso community. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is all of the midweek recap news and announcements that I have. Are there anything big that I have missed? Feel free to jump down in the comments below and let me know what I missed or what you thought of the results. So, with that down out of the way, let's get into another main topic. For all my U.S. Women's National Team fans, you're going to love this next main topic because the U.S. Women's National Team, or the U.S. Soccer Federation, I should say, announced their next friendly in April, and wouldn't you know it, it's against another top three team in the world. The United States are going to take on France on April 13th at 3 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2, which means we get Sebastian Salazar and Julie Foudy, my favorite women's soccer commentating group of all time. It's so much fun. For those of you who don't know who Sebastian Salazar is, please do some Googling and look up Kristen Press, what have you done on YouTube, and you will see all you need to see. It's absolutely phenomenal. But So, the, the good news is, the U.S. are going to get another tough test because I would argue that they need more of these tough tests leading up to the Olympics if they're going to be ready. I think that they've had some decent competition up until um, in 2021 leading up to the Olympics. They've had to face Canada. They've had to face Brazil. They've had to face the Netherlands. And they've played pretty well in all three of those matches, maybe with the exception of Canada. And they played so great, but they still won. So... I, I'm all for the U.S. playing tougher matches because then that's what's really going to get them prepared to shine in the Olympics. You don't get better by playing against opponents that don't meet for 18 months. No offense to Argentina, but that's just kind of the reality of the situation. I think that the U.S. have had a good mix of, I guess we'll call them snowball matches. Like I said, no disrespect to Colombia and Argentina or the like, but in order for the U.S. to prove that they're the best team in the world and continue to be the best team in the world. They've got to play against really tough competition and what better way to do it than in a friendly leading up to these big competitions. So I'm really pumped to see them play against France in April. The bad news is we have to wait about a month from this recording to see it. And I'm getting really antsy. The match is going to be played over in France. I don't know how to say the name of the city because I do not speak very good French. In fact, I don't speak French at all. It's I think it's called Le Havre. I probably butchered it, so for those of you who speak French, feel free to correct me in the comments, because I probably just butchered the name of the city. But nevertheless, the match is going to be really, really exciting. I can't wait to see what comes up. I'm assuming that by that point, the Olympic roster is probably going to be getting close to ironed out for the most part. At that point, we're going to be, let's see, May, June, July, we're going to be about three months away from the Olympics, which I know does, I know sounds like a lot of time, but when you get down to the nitty gritty, that gives them maybe another match or two before they've got to head over to Tokyo, Japan, and start getting prepared and getting into camps and getting acclimated to the environment that they're playing in and all that other good stuff. So not really a lot of time is left on the clock for Vladko in the U.S. to pick the Olympic roster, which I can't wait to see. We've been predicting and talking about it for months now. I think I made my first prediction back in like November, December maybe, so I'm excited to see that come to fruition. And it's just getting really dicey because it's like, okay, with all of these uh, matches going on, some players have been playing really well. For example, I did not expect Christy Mewis to play as well as she has been. She's been scoring or assisting just about in every match that she's played in. Whether or not she's been starting or being subbed on, literally almost every match I believe she scored or assisted in. I can't think of one where she didn't. And if she, if there was one where she didn't, it's probably because she only played like 10 minutes. Like maybe against the 
Maybe against Argentina. Maybe that's the match I'm thinking of where she didn't play a ton. Or maybe it was Brazil. I'll have to go back and check for you guys. But uh, I'm really excited for the U.S. to take on France in this particular case. For those of you who don't know, France is third in the world in the FIFA World Rankings. What those currently look like right now, the United States is number one, Germany is number two, France is number three, and the list goes on and on from there. I don't have the list offhand right now because I, I forgot to write it down. I'm sorry. But it's going to be good for the U.S. to get more tests like this. I would love to see them get one more test before the Olympics after they play against France. The good news is that they have to play uh, Sweden this month in uh, in the month of March. They're playing, I believe, in a few weeks, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to fact check myself later. But if they played Sweden, France, and then maybe one other powerhouse team, like maybe e- England, I would be cool with an England friendly. Who doesn't love a U.S. England friendly? Those are one of my favorite matches to watch, especially in the She Believes Cup. I missed seeing England in the She Believes Cup this year, if you could not tell. But just one more tough test for the U.S. to face, in addition to Sweden and France, just so they're really getting into the rhythm, and just so that they're all ironed out and all the kinks are worked out, and then Vladko can try all of his tactical things that he's been experimenting with. The one interesting note I want to see is, I'm wondering if he'll do a 4-2-3-1 again for a little bit. I noticed that in... The previous uh, one of the previous friendlies in the She Believes Cup, they tried out a four-two-three-one, where they had two holding midfielders in Julie Ertz and Lindsey Horan, and it didn't didn't really work. I don't think it worked so well. Lindsey Horan's def. I don't think the U.S. have enough defensive midfielders to really pull that off. I think for them a four-three-three makes way more sense because we have a lot more creative midfielders than we do defensive midfielders. So take take that what take away from that what you will. But Vladko's the ma- master class tactician, so he would know better than I would. But it's just something I just I like seeing that spiciness in the play a little bit. It's just cool to see, even if it doesn't work. You know, these are just friendlies, and it doesn't hurt. So really exciting stuff. I can't wait to see what he does next. So, ladies and gentlemen, do you have any scoreline predictions for the U.S. Women's National Team France match? Are you excited for the match? Do you think Vladko's unbeaten run of 16 games is going to end? Whatever you think. Feel free to jump down in the comments below and let me know what your thoughts are. All right, so that'll do it for the episode. I want to say for me to you, thanks so much for watching, everybody. I hope you like the different format, more of the looser style of the podcast this week. All that structure was boring me to tears, so I wanted to try something a little bit different. Looking forward to doing that more often in the future. Thanks again for watching, everybody. And until the next time, have a great day.